On November 10th, 2020, Apple rocked the computing world when they revealed that their engineers had designed an entirely new CPU chipset based on the RISC ARM architecture. Not only is the CPU itself incredibly powerful and energy efficient, it has an entire neural engine built in that could revolutionize how AI and machine learning work. Let's find out more. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I have wanted to do this episode for quite a while now, but I wanted to really take the time to understand Apple's new CPU architecture before doing an episode. As I said in the intro, the M1 is based on the ARM RISC or Reduced Instruction Set Computing architecture that has had massive success in everything from embedded car processors to most of the smartphones that people have today. But ARM-based silicone has never powered a desktop or laptop class machine before, and no personal computer architecture has ever had an NPU or a neural processing unit built in. And you can see my episode on NPUs versus GPUs up there if you want to. Three things are going on simultaneously with the Apple M1 that is causing such a stir. Number one, Apple is attempting to break from Intel and the x86 architecture hegemony, which is highly disruptive and, in my opinion, a good thing. Two, Apple is disrupting our expectations of laptop battery life. ARM-based chips sip power compared to CISC Intel chips, which are complex instruction set computing chips. And number three, Apple is disrupting the likes of NVIDIA and even Google by bringing a neural processing engine on board in a consumer class computing device. Will this be powerful enough and have enough resources to do anything useful? I'm really curious to find out. Let's talk about these three areas of disruption, especially the neural engine, in just a moment. But first, if you enjoy this episode, definitely like it so other people can find it, because that's how YouTube works. And of course, subscribe for more of these things. I will be doing another episode comparing the Tesla inference chip to the Apple M1 chip. So I think you'll find that really interesting. So definitely subscribe if you want to see that. Also, a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon. You guys are awesome. It's been really fun having Discord conversations and, you know, just even I'm looking at doing some t-shirt designs and so forth, and I've been getting feedback, so it's been really cool, so thank you. I especially want to give a shout out to my new Patreon patrons, Armand Vervec, I hope I said that right, Jeffrey L. Carver, Bertram Anderer, and Will Depew. Thank you all so much for your help. Also, a quick thank you to Zenly Music for doing the intro and conclusion music. If you want to check him out, definitely look up his link in the description. And of course, if you're in the market for a new Tesla, you can use our referral link below. If you purchase a car through that link, you get 1,000 free supercharger miles, and so do we. Let's look at Apple's attempt to break Intel and the CISC-based x86 hegemony first. That is a lot of acronyms. <laughs> this is not the first time. Uh, in fact, Apple used Motorola chips, they were the 68,000 series chips, starting with their Lisa and then their Macintosh computers in 1983 and 1984, respectively. IBM, of course, went with Intel and their 8086 architecture, and thus a long-standing rivalry between Apple and IBM slash Intel was born. And actually, this isn't the first time that Apple has tried to go with RISC over CISC processors. In the 1990s, Apple and IBM teamed up to create the RISC architecture, and Apple based their computers on the PowerPC CPU chipset at the time. For a while, this chipset, and I remember this, it actually outperformed Intel's x86 computers, but Intel caught up and surpassed Apple and IBM, mostly simply due to the scale and manufacturing ability and, and really focus that they had in the 90s. Thus, in 2001, Steve Jobs basically had to eat his hat and announce that Mac was going all in on Intel. And since then, Macs have been based on Intel CISC processors. Three side notes here. Number one, Jobs asked Paul Ottolini, the CEO of Intel at the time, to make chips for their iPhones, which were released in 2007. Ottolini rejected the idea, thinking they could never sell enough iPhones to justify the development expense. It's like, oh, what a mistake. <laughs> Thus, Apple went with off-the-shelf ARM chips from ARM Holdings UK and eventually licensed the architecture so they could build their A1, 2, 3, etc. chips that still power iPhones. This one's got an A14 inside it. This was a great move as ARM is so crazily power efficient compared to x86 chips. 
Second side note, Apple with TSMC has gotten five nanometer production working with their M1 chips, which is insanely small. Intel is having real problems hitting this die size, and uh, Samsung actually might have to step in and manufacture some of these M1s in the future as well, because Apple is requiring so many of these things to be built. And note number three, what is CISC versus RISC? Just a super quick intro here. Uh, you can check some linked articles below for much more. It's all in the name. RISC is reduced or simple instructions while CISC is complex instructions. This basically means how many commands are in one high level instruction. So RISC only has a handful of instructions while CISC has many times that. So CISC is great if you have to do something really funky. It has, you know, basically like a, an iPhone or an Android, it has an app for that. And it can do those things pretty efficiently, but those complex instructions are hardly ever used and it makes the chips nastily complex and really big and power hungry and hot. So RISC on the other hand only has a handful of instructions, which is detrimental if you have to do a particular complex wonky instruction, it can take many more steps. But most instructions that happen for CPUs are simple things. So most of the time it's more efficient than CISC and the architecture is much cleaner and simpler, in other words, smaller, and it doesn't eat power or get hot like a CISC chip does. For laptops or the Mac mini or a phone or an iPad or something like that especially, one can see that Apple going with a full bore RISC chip has major advantages which is exactly what we're seeing in all the tests that have come out recently. It's got great performance and very low power usage compared to Intel. And while this is first generation, it's based very closely on the iPhone Bionic chips, of which they have had numerous generations. So this architecture is actually well understood and designed by now. So point number one, that Apple wants to disrupt the Intel x86 hegemony is complemented by point number two, that Apple wants to improve their laptop's battery life drastically. Similar to how Tesla has built their own chips for self-driving, making the M1 is crazy expensive, but you get massive market advantage if it does work after all. Having all of the silicon in one place sharing memory or an SOC or silicon on chip is hugely efficient both for processing speed and for power efficiency. Integrating all of the traditionally separate parts of a motherboard into one chip is a huge advantage. Uh, you can see the Mac rumors link down below if you want to read more about that. So what you get in effect is battery life that no PC or Intel based laptop can match. You also of course get extremely good risk based computational performance under normal circumstances and you get a whole bunch of marketing buzz, which is an added bonus. Of course, there's a lot of difficulty doing this, not the least of which is software. They have to build a whole new version of Xcode and actually Big Sur, their new operating system is designed to work with both Intel and the M1 architecture. So basically you have to build a development environment that can compile effectively to both x86 and M1 at the same time. And their laptops and desktops are now split between architectures, which is really inefficient for a period of time. But I expect Apple to move their iMacs to a new M2 chip, you know, M2, something like that, M3, who knows, chip in a year or so, at which point I will likely upgrade. I'm not so sure about their pro desktop lineup now, but it could eventually go that way too. In fact, actually, the more I read about it, the more I think it's actually likely it will. As a weird extra bonus, M1 based laptops can now natively run iPhone and iPad apps, which is actually kind of cool. <laughs> so you can download things from the app store for an iPhone and run it on your computer. And of course, as more software gets developed for the M1 architecture specifically, we will start to see its real potential, like, you know, become more apparent. So Apple is disrupting Intel and Apple is disrupting battery life expectations for laptops. And as a bonus, Apple is disrupting integrated graphics. The M1 destroys Intel chipsets with integrated graphics in them. The only real way to beat an M1 chip graphically is to have a dedicated GPU, which is both expensive and also extremely power hungry, which, you know, of course really matters if you're on a laptop. And you can see the Macworld link below if you wanna read more about that. All right, but what about point number three? What on earth is a neural engine doing in a consumer-oriented product? I had to ask this one myself when I heard about it. In fact, I honestly didn't even believe it when I was told about it. I had to go look it up for myself. So here's what Apple claims. 16 cores, 11 teraflops of performance, machine learning accelerators, good for video analysis, voice recognition, similar to the A14 Bionic chips that has voice recognition for acceleration for Siri, for example also image processing, and they say it's great for machine learning, but this is really kind of muddying the waters. It doesn't appear to be 
the best suited for training models, though it might be, but rather it's good at running models that have been trained previously. This is still super important, but the wording makes it sound like these chips are ideal for training models, which again, they might be, but I'm gonna get into reasons why I don't think that's ideal yet. But I believe the primary focus of these is on running models efficiently. This is what medium, link below, terms, quote, edge computing, or running models on low power processors in real time, as opposed to feeding data to big centralized computers to get a result, as is traditional. Quoting from Medium, quote, a lot of M1's efficiency in AI computing owes to the neural engine, a type of NPU or neural processing unit. Unlike a CPU or GPU, this unit is focused on accelerating neural network operations like matrix math. You've probably heard of another famous NPU out there, Google's TPU or tensor processing unit, end quote. So again, you can check out my video on CPU, GPU, TPU, and NPU <laughs> in the link if you want to. By the way, does this sound familiar to anybody? I am definitely going to do another video on how the M1 and Tesla's inference chips stack up against each other. Of note, the iPhone 12 has the A14 Bionic chip, which also has a neural engine and upon which the M1 is actually built. Again, quoting Medium, quote, instead, the iPhone 12 has what's called the A14 Bionic chip, an 11.8 billion transistor powerhouse that has a fast neural engine, a new image signal processor, and 70% faster machine learning accelerators, end quote. So let's think about a traditional use case of a machine learning model responding to a voice activated question. Something like, Hey Siri, what's the oldest known human artifact? When someone asks this, the voice data would be pre-processed and then uploaded to the cloud. A massive computing cluster with a really big speech analysis model would then decode that and possibly even do the legwork of looking up the results online. Then either the interpreted command or the web results would be sent back to your phone. This is of course time consuming and it breaks if the phone is not connected to the internet for voice recognition. And I know you can't get web results, but you could get the answer to something like, hey Siri, what is the square root of 12 times two to the X when X is 27.5? And by the way, the answer is about 47,726. It answered for me. So what happens with these new chips? The A14 chip inside an iPhone 12 can process a natural language model and do the analysis itself, and thus the phone itself can determine what a user is asking and act upon it. This is edge computing as we talked about, when a model can be processed at the edge of the network, in other words on your phone or laptop, rather than at a central compute cluster. Combining the neural engine with an eight core built-in GPU with 25,000 simultaneous threads, the M1 can really crank through large and complex machine learning models. And, and there's some evidence that it can do training too. For example, here's a quote from Volico, quote, Results show that an M1-powered MacBook Pro with 8-core GPU, 8-core CPU, and a 16-core neural engine had better performance as far as ML capabilities go on TensorFlow than a 1.7, I assume gigahertz, quad-core Intel Core i7-based MacBook Pro. Proving that its new version is better than the previous one is to be expected, but the real eye-opener came when the M1-powered MacBook managed to outperform even the best versions of Mac Pro systems powered by Intel, end quote. This is all great, but much of machine learning depends on massive memory and massive memory throughput. You know, sure you can train small projects on a laptop with 16 gigabytes of RAM, but that's not really adequate for anything big or cutting edge right now. And laptops and Mac minis are severely memory constrained. So sure, they can do some actual machine learning training, but they are going to be best suited to running complex models rapidly and using minimal power while doing so. And that's fine. Being able to efficiently process the ever more complex machine learning models that are being put out into the world is a laudable goal and something to get really excited about. I just wish they didn't make it sound like you could train GPT-3 on a Mac Mini or something. That's just not going to happen without some crazy add-ons. Now, when we get a true desktop class M2 chip, then let's revisit how useful an Apple Mac Pro M2 will be. I'll probably be the first person in line to buy one. Okay, I hope you found this episode interesting and informative. If you did, definitely make sure you like and subscribe. And by all means, ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.